Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the University of Findlay and to the DeBoe and Catherine Freed Contemporary Christian Lecture Series. We are now in our ninth year. The series was established to honor our 16th president, Dr. DeBoe Freed, and his first lady, Catherine Freed. Together, they enriched our campus community and the communities we share with the Churches of God General Conference and with Weinbrenner Theological Seminary. Tonight's speaker, Ms. Nikki Grimes, Harlem born, foster home raised, began writing at age six as a way to cope. It was a lot easier to write an angry poem, she said, than to punch someone out and land in the principal's office. As a writer, her dream, her plan, was to write the great American novel. But God, she is quick to add, had a different idea. And God intervened. Ms. Ms. Grimes' idea for a children's book became a re reality. And soon after this first manuscript was accepted, and, and Groen gr was published, she had an idea for a second book, and then a third. And as she noted in an interview for the Kennedy Center, the next time she looked up, 30 years had passed, and she had a career as a writer of children's books. In the shaping of her stories and poems, tonight's guest calls on personal memories, private conversations, and public responses to equality and rights. She addresses the uncomfortable and presents solutions for righting wrongs. And in the process of writing, she listens to the voice of her characters. Because, she explained, they have their own ideas about what she, as the writer, can say about them and about their place in the story. Pursuing a career as a writer of children's books, she reminds us once again, it was not her plan, it was God's. An early reviewer has this to say about Mrs. Ms. Grimes' newest book, Ordinary Hazards, and this is a quote. Ordinary Hazards is a gorgeous piece of writing that also serves as a powerful inspiration for any reader who has struggled and sought grace. It is a stunning memoir in verse that celebrates the power of the written word and the power of the human spirit. Ordinary Hazards will, will be officially released in October but it's made available to us tonight through the goodwill and the graces of her publisher as a special pre-release event in honor of Dr. Freed and of the Freed series of lectures. It is, by all accounts, an extraordinary book. Our guest is the recipient of numerous and prestigi prestigious writing and book awards with at least one exception. The awards are included in your program notes, and one that's not there that should be is the Lee Bennett Hopkins Children's Poetry Award, and she received that for one last word. Two weeks ago, the Educational Book and Media Association identified Nikki Grimes as a, and, a 2019 recipient of the Jeremiah Luddington Lifetime Achievement Award. In January, when the award is conferred in Puerto Rico, Nikki Grimes will join 41 other recipients of this award since its inception in 1979. The notables include Ashley Bryan, Stephen Kellogg, Tommy DiPaolo, and other familiar names from the Mazza family of authors and illustrators identified as 
making major contributions to educational books. Ms. Grimes, we are honored to have you with us tonight as our guest. Ladies and gentlemen, a beautiful woman of faith, compassion, love, and grace. Please welcome Nikki Grimes. Thank you, Marie. Check is in the mail. <laughs> Paris and David were alone in the dining room setting table, setting the table. David said out of the blue, I used to be afraid of the dark and of the boogeyman and of spiders, all sorts of things. Really? asked Paris. Really? What did you do? I started keeping God in my pocket. Huh? It's something my mom told me once, to keep God in my pocket. I don't understand how. How can God fit inside your pocket? No, that's not it. It just means to keep God close. You know, like he's right there in your pocket, close enough to call on or to talk to. That's what I do when I'm afraid. And that helps? Yep, sure does. And that was all he said on the subject, but it was enough. It was something she'd never forget. That was from The Road to Paris, my novel about a girl in foster care. For several summers, I did a program for Royal Family Kids Camp, a camp for foster children. I was drawn to this ministry because I myself was a foster child, and having spent time in the system, I know the harsh realities of that life. I know firsthand the abuses some of these kids suffer, and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the presence of God in the life of such a child can make all the difference in the world. In writing The Road to Paris, I wanted to make sure young readers understood that too. In fact, for me, with all of the myriad of stories there are to tell in this world, that idea or the possibility of that idea was the tipping point in my deciding to write this particular story. It fits into the broad spectrum of my agenda as an artist, which is to create work that heals, helps, restores, inspires, and is of service. I know, tall order, but that never stopped me. I shared Easter dinner with some friends once, and having learned that I was an author, uh, one of their well-meaning relatives asked, so, are your books Christian? I've been asked this question any number of times, and while I respond a bit differently on each occasion, I do have a stock answer. And so I said something like, Christianity is the grid through which I look at the, at the world and comment on it. And so in that sense, everything I write is Christian. Now I know this was not the answer she was looking for, but thankfully it seemed to satisfy. It doesn't always. I find that people are only truly comfortable when they can slot you into a neat category. Sorry, can't help you with that. On the one hand, I am very much a Christian, sold out to Jesus, leader in the church, whole nine yards. On the other hand, I am a fully vested and fully established author in the mainstream market. How does that work? How do I bring those two worlds together? Am I even supposed to? Oh, to poet like a laser, pierce darkness with one word. That is my dream, to pierce the darkness, to bring light. That is what I consider my call. And it is with that intention that I write. Sometimes my mandate is to help readers navigate the rough, 
waters of grief as the character Darian wrestled with in between the lines. Private Pain by Darian Lopez. Numb, I sit on the edge of the bed, mommy and papi share, shared. I feel light as the ghost my mother has become. Her picture on the bedside table looks blurry until I wipe my eyes. Pobrecito, she would say, if she were here, if she were anywhere in this world. Mijo, she would whisper and touch my cheek, and I would answer, Mommy. But this time, the word never leaves my throat. And what difference does that make? When I wasn't looking, Mommy's heart stopped like a broken clock, half past 36, the final tick, the final talk. Explain to me exactly how I'm supposed to tell time now. Sometimes I'm digging for the true treasure of holy days long smothered by commercialism, like Christmas. What happened to the Christmas of the Bible? The story that started it all. Sometimes I revisit it and take readers along hear Gabriel in Voices of Christmas. Hush, the hour is late. Nazareth lies sleeping, and I wait for my Lord's signal to once again go to earth below. When last I went, my words were for Zachariah. Now I pace the halls of heaven, memorizing a message for Mary. Every archangel I see envies me. I must get the message right. The light of the world is on his way. What will Mary say when I tell her? I wonder what he'll look like. God wrapped in baby's skin. Stepping from eternity into time. How will he hide his glory? How will he hold it all in? Ah, there, the bells chime and I must go. And so I spread my wings and spring from heaven's balcony. When it comes to my work as a Christian author in a secular marketplace, my focus isn't so much on having an impact on the culture as it is having a presence in that culture or making that presence known or felt in a new way, which feels necessary to me. Every time I encounter a piece of literature that portrays so-called Christian characters as two-dimensional buffoons or as evil or as psychologically twisted, I want to scream. But screaming is not as effective as creating books with Christian characters who are none of those things. Christian characters who are multidimensional, flesh and blood, realistically balanced, emotionally and mentally healthy human beings, like myself, like my friends, like many of you. And so if nothing else, my call is about creating literature for young readers in which true people of faith are represented. There's another idea always worming its way through my thoughts on both the conscious and the subconscious level, and that is to bring the Bible to life through, through story in a fresh way for this generation. At break of day, at Jerusalem's gate, dark suns, voices of Christmas, and a girl named Mister all grew out of that intention. With each book, each choice, there is intention, and the foundation of that intention is a series of questions, all of which can be boiled down to one. Am I pleasing God? Am I doing work that pleases God? Am I using my gifts in the way he intended? Can I do more, and if so, what? How? 
These are not questions to be asked once or twice. I ask these questions over and over and over again, and the answer is different every time because God is always revealing something new to me, something new in me, something new that he's leading me to address. His will for me, for my work, for you, is never static. And so in a sense, the only constant with intention is having it. But how do you write with intention? Does every writer of faith work out of call? Does that even matter? And where does story fit into the scheme of things? For many years, I've engaged in a dialogue about intention with other authors of faith. Intention and story aren't all we talk about, of course. We talk about writing as an act of prayer, an act of worship. We talk about answering the call to be salt and light in this world and how we might manifest that as writers. The primary focus of our discussions, though, is this business of intention. When you're talking about intent, you also get into discussing process, and process varies from writer to writer and from project to project. One fellow author named Amy raised some interesting points. I try to put myself in a position to be spoken to, said Amy. I read my Bible, I pray, I try to work on my relationship with God, and he knows I need him every step of the way as I'm writing. I can't do the process without God. But what if the only thing God is telling me to do is write the stories that come to me, and none of those stories are Christian in focus? And my answer to Amy was, well then, follow God. Whatever you do, follow God. But her question reminded me how easily the idea of intention can be misconstrued. Because intention for me is not about creating Christian-themed messages or Christian-themed literature, per se. I'm not composing devotionals. I'm no theologian. I know nothing of hermeneutics. I'm in the business of telling stories. And for me, it is important that those stories have a definable purpose from the start. Always in the back of my mind is a saying I heard years ago. If you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. So I tend to look for something specific at which to take aim. But Amy's process, and perhaps your own, is quite different. Amy says she writes to tell herself a story that she writes because there's something she doesn't understand, and writing a story helps her figure it out. Another good friend named Catherine talks more in terms of broad strokes. She's driven by the Herculean themes of redemption, forgiveness, and grace. My own scope is a bit narrower. In its raining laughter, my poetry book with Miles Pinckney, I danced around the sweet and simple joy of childhood. I caught the laughing bug the other day. Who spread the germ to me? It's hard to say. My brother told a yucky monster story and had to laugh himself. It was so gory. My sister squealed with joy and giggled when dad tickled her. Did I start laughing then? Someone infected me with glee that day. I wonder if God's love could spread that way. And when Daddy prays, I focused on the normalcy of prayer in the workaday life of the believer, spoken in the voice of a child as he watched his father model what it means to be a man of faith, a man of prayer. Daddy takes his early morning post at the window, where he lines his walnut brow. He bows his head, skips the small talk, and quietly ticks off the troubles that litter our street like broken glass. He asks God to meet me at the corner, wielding an invisible broom to sweep aside whatever dangerous slivers I might miss. Unseen, I linger near Daddy's bedroom door, hear him blasting this day's evil in Jesus' name. 
Then I rush outside, laughing off the winter's chill, feeling warm and fearless. In thanks a million, I tackle the attitude of gratitude. That's the core of the poem titled, Shelter. I wish these walls were ours. I wish this bed were mine, that dinner time meant just us three, my brother, mom, and me. I wish I had a room that I was forced to clean. I'd gripe to my best friend and say, come to my house and play. Things could be worse, I know. At least I'm not alone. My mom and brother hold me tight when I cry late at night. Where do the ideas come from? Sometimes it's a snatch of dialogue or a passage of prose that plants itself in my brain and I circle it like a spider laying down story in sticky strips one over the other until the web is complete. That was the case for much of the writing in Jasmine's notebook. This passage was one that got me going. It seems to me that ideas are like gossamer or mist, fragile as a dream forgotten as soon as you awake. I guess that's why they're so hard to hold on to. But that's also what makes them wonderful and more than worth all the trouble. At other times, I plod along the desert of my mind, laying down character and plot in a dry fashion, waiting for the drop of inspiration that will make the desert bloom. When I wrote The Road to Paris, I shook my proverbial canteen and outflowed the line, keep God in your pocket, which led to the passage I opened with tonight. I love that line, and I'm not the only one. A few years ago, I spoke to students in, uh, a Baltimore, in Baltimore at a library, and their class had just read The Road to Paris. And one of the students came to the event with something special for everyone. She passed around a basket filled with colored discs on which she had written in gold, God. She wanted each person to have a reminder, not of the book per se, but of God's closeness. I had a hard time not weeping then. I have a hard time not weeping every time I think of it. You never know what God's going to do with what you put out in the world. Even though that line came from my pen, I can hardly take credit for it. I'm just happy it's made an impact on some of my readers and grateful that the line came to me during the writing process. Process is mysterious, truth be told. But no matter the process, what makes an idea work ultimately is story. In my work, story presents itself in both poetry and prose. It's no secret, though, that poetry is my first love. Here are a few favorite excerpts from some of my novels in verse. Field trip in the voice of the Bible's Ishmael and first sleepover in the voice of contemporary teen Sam, our favorite poems from the novel, Dark Sons. Field trip. I stroke my hunter's bow and stretch the string like memory, snapping back those happy days, those sweaty hours spent with father outside the camp. He'd balance a bow tall as me while I proudly swung its smaller twin between shoulder blades knobbier than I knew, and we would trek for miles in search of prey. How old was I? Seven? Ten? He was Papa then and could hardly wait to teach me the feel of bowstring, to shape an arrow's tip, to plant my feet and grip the bow just so, to see with nose and ear 
as well as I. These were lessons whispered on the wind. Listen, son, he would say. If you are still as oak, you can sense your prey before it bounds into view. And so we too would fill a field with silence, just us men, drenched in sunlight, dripping joy, patient hunters, whose matching heartbeats drummed out conversations only God could share. First sleepover. It's weird backpacking into my room, a place as alien as a space station on Mars. I scan the wall where basketball stars preen from posters handpicked by dad's new wife. This room is all yours, she says. Arrange it however you like. I strike a pose of nonchalance, then mutter, thanks remembering lifelong lessons of politeness and courtesy. Sleep well, she says, and disappears. I kick my shoes off to test the mattress with a 2.5 dive and belly flop. Eyes squeeze shut, I order myself to stop imagining Dad and Rachel rubbing up on each other around the corner down the hall. I crawl under the covers, create a clever mantra to lull myself to sleep. So what if it's a lie? This is normal. This is normal. This is normal. There are many subtle and organic ways to weave the presence of God into a story, even when the story is geared for a secular audience. In Words with Wings, the opening poem introduces both the name of the main character and the faith of her family with a single flourish. Prologue. Mom loves angels. Their pink-cheeked faces peek from pictures on every wall in every room. So surprise, mom decided to call me Angel. Dad said enough already. He didn't want his kid named after some silly, weak-looking, chubby cherub. He wanted a strong name for his girl to take out into the world. Mom is stubborn, though. She flipped through the Bible, found a few fierce angels, and tried again. What about naming her after Gabriel? He was so fierce, people fainted at the very sight of him. That's all Dad needed to hear. The God story, namely the Bible, is frequently referred to in my books. I also love incorporating names that evoke God and his kingdom. In Planet Middle School, for instance, one of the characters' name, names is Glory. Again, in Garvey's choice, God finds his way into the story through Emmanuel, Manny for short, Garvey's new best friend. Here, though, a lot more than God's name is embedded in the story. Pink eyes. Paler than skim milk, a strange boy sits next to me. I can't help but stare. It's called albinism, he says. The word makes me shiver. My whispered sorry floats on the air between us. The pink-eyed boy shrugs. This is me. Get over it. Sounds like something I should say. Advice. Later, when chorus is done, I hang with Manny, join him on the bus. Got something on your mind, G? I like when he calls me that. I was wondering how you stand kids teasing you. I'm honest, he says. I've got albin albinism. Fact. I look strange. No changing that. Is there more to me? Sure. Kids yell albino boy. I don't turn around. Choose the name you answer to. No one can do that but you. His words. Manny tells me he was made in God's own image. God is beautiful, he says. 
So what's that make you and me? Do you get it, G? I carry his words in the pocket of my mind. A few times a day, they remind me to ignore the kids who don't know my name. Sometimes God shows up on the page in a more straightforward way, as in Bronx Masquerade. There I wrote in a character named Sterling S. Hughes because I'd never encountered a character like him in a book for young readers or young adults, and I wanted to. My name is Sterling Sampson, but everybody calls me preacher. I intend to become a science teacher, not a preacher, but I don't mind being called one. Just so long as you don't call me Samson, I'm hoping to end up in a little better shape than he did. A brother named Leon accidentally bumped into me as I approached the cashier. He spilled, or should I say poured, a cupful of honey on my shoes. My new shoes. Oops. Looks like Mr. Goody Two Shoes got a mess to clean up, he said, laughing. I need you, Lord. Hold back the Samson in me. I may not have his strength, but you know I have his temper. All my life, I've seen my mother pray, and all my life, I've seen her prayers answered. So, of course, I believe. I believe big. And between the lines, faith in God is the biggest reason Darian survives his mother's death, that Malcolm survives his father's incarceration, that Kyle survives a life of heart defects. Hope. The heart can be a fragile thing, but we forget. It's hidden so deep inside the chest, the beats are imperceptible unless fear, anxiety, and exertion makes the heart race, thunder violently against the rib cage, a rage of blood bringing it to a full stop or skip, leaving us in that netherworld halfway between life and death, the end of breath, if only for a second. I'm a seasoned traveler to that distant place. My heart, a fragile passenger, riding on the will of God, on the will God still gives me to be here one more day, to hope for one more tomorrow. Confidentially speaking, hope is for the strong, not for the weak, yo and I would know. Finally, of course, comes Ordinary Hazards, a memoir. There's no escaping the God of grace in this story. This is a story of darkness and light, and grace is the reason I survived to tell the story. Here are a few excerpts from that. Imaginary friends. Mommy had a secret life, a kind of play that was more serious than I knew. Sometimes I'd catch her talking to people who weren't there. Finger to her lips, she'd shush me whenever I asked, Mommy, who are you talking to? It would be years before paranoid schizophrenia grew roots in the soil of my own vocabulary. On our own. No one warned me the world was full of ordinary hazards, like closets with locks and keys. I learned this lesson when mom, without her cousin to fall back on, left us daily with a succession of strangers while she went to work. One woman was indisputably a demon in disguise, full lips grinning slyly as mom waved goodbye each morning. See you after work, mom said that first day. 
The second she was out of sight, demon's smile melted like hot paraffin. Snatching up Carol and me, she dragged us kicking to the bedroom closet. She shoved us in quick as the witch in Hansel and Gretel, jamming the key in the lock. You tattle to your mom about this, she growled. I'll come back and beat the black off you. Deadly threat delivered, she left for the day. Two, I screamed, my puny fist pounding the door till Carol caught me by the wrists and held me still. Shh, she whispered. It's okay, I'm right here. Once my breathing slowed, Carol left me long enough to navigate the darkness. She found suitcases to sit on. Sniffling, I perched on the edge of one and pressed my fingertips together. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I repeated those words like a chant. I was three years old. It was the only prayer I knew. <laughs> and where is the rest of it? Okay. I guess you're not going to get the rest of it tonight. She said, not able to find what happened to that one. Okay. Well, we'll pretend that we got all the way to the end. <sighs> Binge. Babysitters came and went with mom pulling in all the overtime she could manage, taking the edge off each day with a shot or two or three of blackberry brandy. Sometimes she'd disappear in an alcoholic haze and be missing for days, leaving with no one at home to watch over us. Carol, nearly five years my senior, would play little mama, mixing raw oats and buttermilk for us to eat, anything to fill our bellies. Someone must have noticed us alone and telephoned child services because they showed up one day. The policeman and the freckle-faced lady who came to our door, smiling inappropriately, asked if we knew where our mommy was or our daddy. When we shook our heads, no, they took us away. I tugged my big sister's hand. Carol, are they taking us to jail? No, she said. So why did they pile us in a police car like we were guilty of some crime? Aftermath. They kept us together for two years serving us up to strangers, a merry-go-round of unfamiliar places, unknown faces, of people with names my tears washed away. Don't ask me how many homes or where those days are lost. I held on to nothing except my sister's hand. Eventually, there would be one more foster home for me, the Buchanans of Osning, New York. Too many pairs of eyes stared in my direction. I half hid behind Mr. Klein, ready to follow him into the living room, partly because there was a dog barking outside that didn't sound very friendly, and partly because there was no place else for me to be, and I wanted to get away. Isolation station. The house was full, but with strangers, and I was there by myself in the dark in a tiny pocket of a room with a tiny bed to sleep in, a little space for the fears I'd packed in my suitcase, which makes no sense because why would I bring them with me? 
And the night sounds far into the city girl left me tossing and turning. There was no more room in my head to hold the anger rising like steam, searing the edges of my brain. There was not even a shelf where I could stack the questions crying out for answers that wouldn't come. Why did mom love liquor more than Carol, more than me? Why did daddy let strangers take us away? Why did grandma refuse to come to our rescue? Why didn't they love us? Why didn't anyone love us enough? Why, 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 why? Stop! I leapt out of bed, switched on the light, grabbed a piece of paper and a pen, stabbed the page and let my thoughts gush like a geyser, shooting high into the moonless sky, then falling down on the page I held captive till every line was stained with my feelings and the heat of them finally had a chance to cool and suddenly I could breathe, breathe, breathe. And there was once again room enough in my head and my heart to just be. Then I closed my eyes and it was morning. Baptist Beginnings. One Sunday the family took me to Star of Bethlehem for the first time. I slid into the pew, closed my eyes, and listened to the organ, letting the music hug me on the inside. Notebook. I sing around the house all the time. Ken says I should join the choir. God, what do you think? Me too. I could live at church, you know. But most people only want to talk to you once a week. Psst. Come close, and I'll tell you God's secret. Music is his most favorite thing. There are bands in the Bible, strumming harps, blowing trumpets, thumping tambourines and cymbals too. Play something, say the angels. But I don't know how. Sing then, say the angels. So I do. I should have stayed with the Buchanans, but I didn't. My mother remarried and asked me to come home to live with her, to be part of a new family. I had no idea what kind of man she'd married or what dark days lay ahead. Intruder. Come on, I snapped impatient for the shower water to warm. While I waited, I checked my reflection in the bathroom mirror. That big-breasted girl was a stranger. I hated how my shirts hugged me, how I jiggled when I walked, how boys looked at me like I was an ice cream cone with two scoops. I climbed into the tub, lathered quickly, and stood beneath the shower head, eyes closed, enjoying the feel of wet needles pelting me. Then I froze. Who's there? I asked. Sure, I'd heard the door open. I looked through the steam and made out a shadow. Search my life for luck and bad is all you'll find. Keep an eye out for grace, though. Hard evidence appears round every corner. It is the invisible bridge spanning the abyss, the single light that outstrips the dark every time. Good and evil, suffering and salvation, poverty and plenty, grief and glory and grace, they're all part of life. And as authors, we have the opportunity to weave all these themes into our stories. Don't hold any of it back, especially not from young readers. They deserve work that is varied, rich, complex, and above all, authentic, whether the subject is football or faith. Whatever your profession, 
be salt, be light. The world has never needed it more. Thank you. Time for questions? Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, I may not have the answers, but you can ask them. Come on, don't wait for me to go back to California. <laughs> It'd be too late then. Um, I was, th first, thank you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your life as a reader influences your work as a writer. Has my? L your life as a reader influences your work as a writer. Oh. Uh, Hmm. I guess the biggest way is that even though I was an avid reader who, I was one of those readers who went to bed with a flashlight so that I could read once the lights were out and I, I would go to the library, I would read in the library, public library, school library, I would borrow as many books as I could every week and I'd read them all and come back and start it all over again. And I read so avidly, in fact, by the time I got to college, my professors had to make up separate reading lists for me because I already read all the books on their list. With all of that reading, I came across very few books who had anybody in them who looked like me or who represented my life in any way. Um, there were no sheep on my street, no cows, no pigs on four legs anyway. You know, and I was like, where are stories about the city where I live and about people who look like me? So that definitely impacted my choice to write what I do. I wanted to have books that featured not only African Americans, but who lived in different places, in different environments, because the books that I came across were either about slavery or they were African folk tales or they were the civil rights era and we did not exist in books beyond that. And I'm like, hello, we're here. You know, why aren't we seeing ourselves in books? So uh, that was definitely an influence on uh, the books that I write, for sure. Yes. Where do you realize, uh, rely on uh, your strength and faith? Do you have any particular uh, religion or? Well, I'm a Christian, born okay. again. Okay, biblically, you yeah. search the scriptures. Okay. Yes. Um, so having foster parents, would you say that the one, the last set that you were talking about, were they the ones who influenced you the most when it came to finding God, and like in every in every way they were great. Of course, at my age, I didn't realize who they were, what they were. Looking back, I realized, oh, God placed me in a God-fearing household. That was not a mistake. Um, and they, I learned mostly from example how they lived their lives and how. They cared for people. There, there was a, a, a family who'd been fostering kids for years and continued to foster long after I left. And they adopted uh, a couple of kids along the way, too. Um, but they were powerful um, people of faith. And yeah, that had everything to do with uh, influencing me and giving me, like, from the very start, a really positive experience in, in the church in church life, so. Yes? Why do you want to tell people about your life? Why do I want to tell people about my life? 
because I feel that my story is the single most important story I have to tell. Um, and because it is a story of both darkness and light and a story of great grace. And I think that's the kind of story we really need to hear today, to know that there is definitely life at the end of the tunnel. There is reason to hope. The hope is, sorry, I love Emily Dickinson, but for me, hope was not a feather. It was something really solid and strong. It was a rock, you know, for me to stand on. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of the reason I am here today. And so I, I want young people who are wrestling with things to know that that kind of grace, that kind of strength, uh, that kind of hope is available. What inspired you to be a writer? Well, when I first started writing, reading and writing were my survival tools. They were how I just got through life. I didn't even think about writing as a profession until maybe high school. But up to then, it was just um, how I got things off my chest. Something was bothering me, and I didn't feel I had people around me who I could talk to. But I would talk to God, and I would write about the things that were on my mind or on my heart. And then little by little, I, I understood as a reader how important stories could be, how they can help you. Because I would read stories that would help me in different ways. And I thought, I'd like to, to do that for somebody else. Write something that would be a source of encouragement or uh, help to, to a reader. There's something about reading a story when you think, you know, you're wrestling with something that you think nobody else has ever wrestled with. Uh, or nobody else would understand, and then you come across a character in a book that is living that exact same thing, and all of a sudden you feel less alone in the world. And so I wanted to put out stories to the world that would have that kind of impact on, on other readers. Um, I really enjoyed uh, Denitra Brown. Mm -hmm. class clown and I was just wondering is that character based on anyone you knew uh, there's a little bit of me in Denitra and a little bit of my closest childhood friend in um, in Zuri um, and then the rest is fictional but there's there's definitely something of me and my attitude and and of hers in there um, and it's funny, well, kind of magic, magical in a way, when uh, Floyd Cooper did the art and uh, my best friend's mom saw the art, she said, oh, you sent him pictures of you. And I'm like, no, I didn't. But there was such a strong similarity between the characters he drew, mind you, and he was working for models, okay? But there was such a strong similarity that uh, at one of the events, my friend Deborah actually took a, a photograph uh, and showed it to Floyd, and he almost fell over. He couldn't believe the similarities. So, you know, magical things like that happen. But yeah, those characters were loosely based on, on us and our relationship. Maybe sure. Yeah. OK. Is there any particular book that you would recommend for other children in foster care that you've written? Uh, depend, well, if they're you know, elementary or early middle school, definitely it would be um, The Road to Paris. If they're in their teens, I have a, a teen character in between the lines who's um, approaching aging out of the system, and that was something, uh, a subject I wanted to address. And so there's a character there, and I have her meet uh, someone who does a, a ministry for teens who age out of the system. And in the back of the book, I have, um, I have a listing of resources because I want teachers to, to have them available, and I also want the teens who read the book to um, you know, have, have access to them. And then I have more information on my website um, to add to that. Because there are 
thank God, some organizations around the country um, that are beginning to address that issue because a huge percentage of those kids end up homeless or end up vulnerable to sex trafficking um, because they have just no, they have no foundation, they have nothing to fall back on. Once they, you know, leave the system, they're usually just, you know, out on their butts. Um, and so that was an important thing for me to include in between the lines. So. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you.